Um, it is my great pleasure now to introduce um, uh, our final speaker of the day, but um, one worth waiting for. Uh, Elizabeth Glazer has lived a life dedicated to public service. Um, she's got impeccable credentials. She graduated from uh, Harvard undergrad, went to Columbia Law School, and was a law clerk for Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was with the uh, Eighth Circuit. She's been a trailblazer at the federal, state, and local level. She served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. And for those of you who know the Southern District or don't know it, it's sort of the Navy SEALs of the Department of Justice. And she rose there to be head of the Violent Crime Unit, where she did uh, nationally recognized work. She served in state government, where she was the Deputy Secretary of Public Safety uh, under Governor Cuomo and had responsibility for eight state agencies, including corrections, parole, state police, and the National Guard. Uh, she currently serves as the Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in New York City, uh, where she's responsible for policy and strategic implementation in three key areas which should resonate with all of us here today. Enhancing public safety, reducing unnecessary incarceration, and increasing fairness. Uh, we're honored and excited to have her, and last but not least, she's lived her whole life in New York City, but she's sort of a Pittsburgher. Uh, and I say that because, you know, we don't cross bridges. And Liz doesn't cross Fifth Avenue. She's <laughs> lived in the Upper West Side of New York within four blocks of her uh, birth home her whole life. So she understands our territorialness, but she also <laughs> understands criminal justice, and we're glad to have her. Liz. And uh, thanks to all of you for inviting me and my colleagues, and I include you, even though you're not from New York. Uh, so great. Um, yes, I am feeling a little bit of vertigo not being within four blocks of my birth home. Um, but I'll try and power through. Uh, do I just press this button to? All right, yes, so um, I have a gazillion notes now because, in fact, everybody said, Liz will cover it. <laughs> and so, but if I don't cover it, hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, so I, uh, we've been talking today about sort of transforming the criminal justice system. Um, and I actually think the question is completely different. We have like a category problem here, which is, um, are we actually seeing the end of the criminal justice system as the primary way to keep us safe? That's what I really think this is all coming down to. Um, when we talk about how we use uh, arrest, enforcement, jail, prison, um, we're trying to solve a problem, but are we using the wrong tools? Uh, and is what we should be doing actually something that comes way, 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 way before the criminal justice system and is way, 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 <laughs> way more affirmative than the criminal justice system. So in New York City, I'm breaking the Jacobson rule. I will talk about New York City because I never leave it. Um, <laughs> You know, we are seeing this radical transformation of the criminal justice infrastructure. Um, certainly over the past six years, there's just been very, very dramatic drops in, in crime and incarceration and enforcement. Um, and, you know, we never tire of saying we're the safest big city in the nation. And added to that, we have the lowest incarceration rate of any big uh, city in the nation. So I, I had wanted to kind of, um, every page now is covered with, uh, with notes of the things I'm supposed to add, but I'm going to, let me sort of zip through this. So um, 
a lot of this has sort of been covered by previous speakers, um, but the point here is just that this shows us the five big cities, New York, Los Angeles, Philly, Houston, and Chicago, starting in kind of uh, the mid-80s when we started to see a big rise uh, in both crime and incarceration, and then we see that big downward slope uh, through the late 90s and to today. And really, the only point of this slide is to say, we, th this looks at crime. I'm looking at murder, because murder is sort of a pretty stable, uh, you know, it's hard to argue with cr murder as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a marker of what your crime rate looks like. Um, but our incarceration rates look sort of like this as well. Um, and the point of the slide is just to say, we have all, um, seen kind of more or less the same kind of trends of big uh, bump in crime peaking in the early 90s and then now on the downward trend. Um, but New York City's trends have been steeper and more durable uh, than other places. And what is interesting about New York is that um, especially in the last few years, the last six years where these trends have accelerated, um, the main thing that we've begun to demonstrate, I think, is that you can have more safety with less enforcement. As crime has continued to drop, um, the foot has come off the gas of enforcement in a major, major way. Um, some of that is related to the fact that there's less crime, so there are fewer arrests. But a lot of that has to do with policy. So you see a big, big drop in arrests over the last six years, a lot of that driven by a policy decision um, not to arrest for certain kinds of marijuana offenses. Uh, you see a big, big drop in criminal summonses, which were um, really a kind of touch point in New York City because it was for very minor offenses, largely uh, in African-American and Latino neighborhoods for uh, being in the park after dark for uh, drinking outside. Uh, those criminal summonses, if you didn't show up to court, resulted in a warrant. We ended up dismissing 700,000 warrants that were over 10 years old just because people hadn't shown up in court for these very low-level summonses and ultimately switched that from criminal summonses to civil summonses. And I'll get back to, and so what's the point of the criminal justice system. If you're trying to get people not to uh, drink in public, just because we've switched it from a criminal summons to a civil summons, have we actually changed that behavior? Um, is this the way in which we should be trying to cha change folks' behavior? But nonetheless, the hand of the state is much lighter in New York City, and that has other effects that are positive. Stop and frisk, which was also an enormous flashpoint in the city. Um, at our, uh, the height uh, during a previous mayor's, pr Mayor Bloomberg's administration, uh, we stopped um, over 700, uh, 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 almost 700,000 people a year, uh, only in a few neighborhoods, African American and Latino neighborhoods. Uh, this left an imprint in those neighborhoods uh, of deep distrust of law enforcement, of police, and frankly, just of government in general, and a really sort of bitter aftertaste um, that those neighborhoods were being treated unequally and unfairly. And it's not just that we have less crime um, with less enforcement. We also have more, sa more safety and less incarceration. So a lot of people have talked about this already. Um, but it is really a dramatic drop from the, the early 90s when we had about 21,000 people in our jails um, to today when we have under 7,000, um, well on our way to 3,300. I'll talk about that in a second. In the last six years, that has accelerated in a very major way um, for a variety of reasons that I'll run you through because I think they may be of interest to you. Um, but in the last six years, the number of people just entering jail has dropped by half. And so wh what has actually, oh, sorry, I never get tired of talking about the drop in the jail population, and this may be interesting to you. 
Um, so this sort of shows what New York City's rate of, of incarceration is compared to other big cities. Um, you'll see we're pretty close to Chicago, but Chicago has a murder rate that's about 10 times New York City's. Uh, I w did a little bit of a calculation to figure out what um, Allegheny County's incarceration rate would be if it was similar to New York City, and you'd have about 950 people in your jails if you were at our current incarceration rate, if you were at the rate that we hope to be at when we're at 3,300 people, you'd have 470 people in your jails. Um, so this is a dramatic thing that's happened, but jails really just hold up a mirror to the way in which the criminal justice system operates. They themselves, except in sort of some minor ways, don't themselves affect their own population. Um, it's the criminal justice system and many, many different parts of the criminal justice system. Um, and the criminal justice system, as you guys know, has no boss. So nobody is directing the criminal justice system, whatever that might be, to put fewer people in jail. Um, you have independently elected district attorney's offices. In our city, at least, you have a court system that's run by the state. You have a police department that's run by the city. Um, but all of them have an effect on who ends up in the in the um, in the uh, jails and how long they, they stay, and so a number of things uh, affected how it is that at least over the last six years that jail population has dropped so dramatically. And just to sort of give you a sense, our jail population, like everybody's, I think, sort of has been bumping along at declines of about one or two percent a year um, uh, you know, over the past couple of decades. Uh, when uh, Mayor de Blasio, the mayor that I work for, uh, came into office, uh, we bumped that up to about five or six percent a year for a couple of years. It then jumped to dropping by about 10 or 11 percent a year. By this year, we we're dropping by about 15 percent a year. And so what's driving that? Well, the first thing that's driving that is, sure, cops are arresting fewer people. There's no question about that. But not every arrest ends up in jail. Um, and so that's only about 25% of this very dramatic drop. So if we've dropped about 40% of our population in the last six years, uh, the fewer arrests is, uh, account for about a quarter of that. About 50% of it, though, uh, is the result of judges not putting people in. That sounds sort of pretty obvious, but judges will only not put people in if they have some option between nothing, as Michael was mentioning, about 70% of people who show up um, before a judge are released with no conditions at all, if they have a, some, some option between nothing and jail, and so one of the things that the city did was create a program called supervised release that gives judges that option between jail or nothing. Uh, and the, the program was created with the participation sitting around a table of judges, DAs, defenders, and corrections all together, <laughs> which sort of protected the program against the inevitable bad thing that's going to happen. Um, and when it does, that group nonetheless stands behind it. So that's about 50% of the reduction. Um, but I think that the most significant thing um, is that the behavior of New Yorkers has simply changed. So I think Judge Lippman mentioned that, you know, in 1990, at the height of our murders, 2,200 people were killed in the city of New York. Obviously, just one murder is too much. Last year, it was 300. That is a significant change in the way people behave. Uh, and I think that um, when we think about what the criminal justice system is supposed to do, it's supposed to keep us safe, it's supposed to change people's behavior, if it's not doing that, then we should find some other methods of getting people's behavior to change. And those things are some of the things that I'd like to talk about that we're starting to do about how we have less of a police-centric 
uh, way of creating safety and more of a neighborhood-powered and neighborhood-led uh, way of creating safety. So for all the good news of crime, incarceration, enforcement all being down, um, what many of the speakers have talked about and what is runs throughout all of our systems um, is this enormous uh, disparity, racial disparity. Uh, so in our jails, uh, it's overwhelmingly African American and Latino. And when you look at our city, which is a very, very segregated city, and you don't have to know New York to, um, for this to have meaning for you, um, but essentially th those areas that are circled are um, largely African American and Latino. They are also our poorest neighborhoods. Uh, they are also the neighborhoods where the crime is highest and where every other indicia of social distress is present, whether it's asthma or mortality rates uh, or low educational achievement or high unemployment. And these things are very, very uh, related. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to just sort of go through what is it that, you know, how is it that New York City came to this point um, of this massive acceleration in drops in crime, incarceration, um, and enforcement. And the first thing I would just say is um, I think that, that, the, um, that the sense of kind of the deep unfairness of how the justice system operated and what kind of impact it was having on people in New York City um, became a very powerful voice over the last six years. Um, the mayor ran his campaign uh, to become mayor six years ago on, uh, on a story of a tale of two cities, of the very rich and the very poor. He ran on a campaign uh, to uh, reduce stop and frisk, which had become associated with uh, kind of the occupation of uh, communities of color. Um, and he featured in his ads his son uh, talking about what it felt like uh, to be an African, young African-American man um, in New York City. When he was elected, um, he uh, appointed as his police commissioner, Bill Bratton, uh, which was sort of a surprise and slightly ironic choice because Bill Bratton had been the architect 20 years before of broken windows policing, which in fact um, had kind of birthed stop and frisk, which had ultimately been used to such um, deleterious effect in the city. Um, but he returned with a very different message and a kind of message of proportionality uh, as to how it is that he would uh, police. But that year that the mayor was uh, elected was a very volatile year. Um, it was the year of Ferguson. It was the year of Eric Garner, uh, who was selling loose cigarettes in Staten Island when he was uh, approached by police officers and in the course of arresting him, uh, they killed him. And it raised deep questions of, is it worth it that somebody should die um, because he's selling loose cigarettes or even because he's resisting arrest? Um, and are there other tools that should be used um, to address quality of life issues um, if that's what the concern is? And um, the mayor, in the course of this big controversy, discussed how he um, talked to his own son about his relationship to the police and how he should be careful when he is encounters police officers. And these sort of two trends um, became very, very volatile. There was enormous uh, turmoil that culminated or uh, found uh, in 
the murder of two police officers sitting in their car in Brooklyn um, at the end of that year um, by somebody who'd come up from Baltimore with the intention of killing police officers and simply walked up to their car and shot them. Um, but the tension between uh, the mayor and the police union um, and the controversies over how it is the city would be policed and how it would be policed fairly so was maybe best um, captured at the funeral of the two officers um, when some of the police officers turned their back on the mayor. What happened um, right after the, uh, the murder of the two officers was a dramatic drop in arrests and a dramatic drop in our jail population. Um, what is particularly interesting about this, though, is that we often see a drop in um, both arrests and incarceration in November or December, um, but it usually bounces right back. Something else was going on here. Uh, there was something about this drop where the police did not come back and did not continue to arrest for a whole array of offenses that they had arrested for um, before. And nonetheless, crime continued to drop. The following year, this feeling of sort of fatigue with enforcement as, as the only solution um, was amplified. You can see here the names of people sort of across the nation uh, whose deaths uh, at the hands of officers were caught on video. The sense of whether or not that death, you know, because of the video, it felt very immediate, and whether it was in Baton Rouge um, to someone in Brooklyn, it felt like it was right down the block. And at the same time, there was an enormous cost paid by police officers also. Um, it, four officers killed, uh, as you can see on this, uh, on this list, and and so that sense of sort of what is the price that we're paying um, for keeping the peace uh, through uh, the kinds of methods that we use now. Um, and at the same time that this was happening on the street, uh, there were big questions that became quite vivid about what the price was of using incarceration at the rates that we had used it. Judge Lippman uh, this morning uh, went through the incredibly sad case of Khalif Browder, arrested at 16, um, ultimately his case dismissed three years later, uh, and ends up hanging himself uh, or killing himself. Um, and just, you know, a note just to follow up on what Michael was saying about probation, he had a low amount of bail, but the bail wasn't the only thing that kept him in. What kept him in was a probation hold. Uh, and there was another case as well that sort of raised the issue of how we police what we incarcerate for, uh, which was the case of Jerome uh, James Murdow, who was found by police officers sleeping in a stairwell uh, in one of our housing developments. Uh, he was homeless. He had uh, mental health issues. Uh, he appeared before a judge who saw a long history of bench warrants because he is, was unstably housed. Um, he ends up being put in Rikers because the judge is concerned that he won't return back. Uh, and uh, he dies there uh, in an overheated cell. And that is the same year that Judge Lipman sort of outlined uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, came out with their findings about conditions of confinement of Rikers um, and talked about sort of the culture of brutality there. So these um, are all the kinds of things, these are the kinds of conditions at Rikers that we were dealing with at the time. Um, that sense of sort of the isolation of, an, uh, of people confined on an island in the middle of the East River, far from family and lawyers and services. Um, there was uh, that all those sort of issues uh, coalesced into a big movement, Close Rikers, which uh, the judge sort of went through, making very, very powerful and very present 
uh, the voices of people who had been formerly incarcerated, of their families, uh, and of advocates. Uh, and uh, that year, in 2017, the mayor announced that uh, the city would actually close Rikers Island and would move uh, off the island then by in 2027, we've now shortened it to 2026, um, and build uh, smaller facilities uh, that were in the, the uh, that were in the boroughs. And so there was this sense that there was this moral imperative to close Rikers, uh, that it, to close it would be, uh, and to change the culture inside, and to build uh, smaller and more humane facilities uh, would uh, be beneficial for the entire justice system and for the safety of, of all New Yorkers. So we are now um, involved in that effort to, uh, to you know, the population is reduced significantly. Um, we anticipate that we're at 7,000 now. We'll drop that by about half, and we're pretty confident that 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 we're on our way to that. Um, and now we're involved in actually the building of, uh, and starting to sort of let the contracts to actually build the buildings. Uh, and I think the, the values that we uh, are fulfilling here is this sense that um, we're not just building buildings, uh, but we are building facilities that will be civic assets, both inside and outside, meaning that the people inside are assets, whether they're the people who are incarcerated, as Stanley sort of spoke about very eloquently, um, or whether they are the buildings themselves that should be viewed as civic assets uh, within the neighborhood and support uh, life within the neighborhood uh, as well. So, uh, let's see where we're going. Um, so essentially, this shows you know where Rikers Island is. We are going to build four facilities, uh, one in each of the boroughs, um, and I. Yep, yep. I uh, and we've gone through sort of quite uh, quite a process. New York has a very very participatory process in approving the use of land to build facilities, um, a process that we just ended uh, a month or so ago with a vote by the city council approving us to build these buildings. Uh, and the process that we went through was intense community engagement um, with many, many uh, elected officials, neighborhood groups, advocacy groups, um, and that is something that will uh, continue uh, as we go through the building process. Um, right now, we're in the process of designing um, uh, those buildings uh, and figuring out sort of what the programming space looks like to ensure that it, uh, the buildings themselves are welcoming <coughs> to visitors, uh, are uh, humane environments for both staff uh, and people who are incarcerated so that they have the space um, for, uh, for, uh, for programming, that living space has, uh, has access to sunlight uh, and can have a kind of normalized environment because everybody who's in is going to go back to their neighborhoods. Um, and these are just some examples of um, what those kinds of facilities might look like, taken from um, places uh, both in the United States um, and in Europe. Of course, I can't see this, but we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and so obviously the inside is incredibly important, um, but what it looks like on the outside, uh, how it integrates into neighborhoods, what kind of space there is for communities actually in the buildings, um, and how we truly turn them into civic assets is uh, one central part of sort of the work that's going on right now. Um, and so when I say that, 
we think of these facilities not just as buildings. We think about sort of the great civic buildings that we have in New York City and that Pittsburgh has and that every city has. In New York City, we had, had once, um, a great train station called Pennsylvania Station, a place that sort of inspired, um, you know, a sense of awe. Uh, this is a picture of a famous parliament building, again, built to sort of welcome um, uh, people and to make them feel part of a civic uh, enterprise. There are other great civic buildings. The New York Public Library surely makes you want to read a book. Um, and even things that are sort of pretty uh, regular civ civic functions, fire stations, a salt shed, um, can, be, uh, can be beautiful and dignified and inspire a different kind of way of being inside for both people who work people who are incarcerated, and people who visit. And so we laugh when we say, and why can't jails be like that? But we shouldn't, uh, because as long as we have jails, they should be the places uh, in which people are treated with dignity and humanity, and which the physical surroundings themselves uh, permit that to happen. happen. So this is a rendering of what potentially the Brooklyn facility might look like. We still have a ways to go to, um, to get bids and have the places built. And we certainly have challenges as well, and I'll give you just two. Uh, the judge mentioned no new jails, um, a group that said, why are you building jails at all? Um, and I think that's actually not to be dismissed. Uh, it is a serious challenge. It, it was one that was taken very seriously by elected officials and by others in New York City. Um, and it actually is the challenge to us now, which is, is jail the best way for us to get people to behave? Is jail the best way for us to secure our safety? Uh, it surely has a role, um, I think, uh, but not the footprint that we have today. On the other side of the ledger, we have the amount of money that it's going to cost uh, for us to build facilities. Facilities that surely we hope to build to be adaptable to other uses if our population goes lower than 3,300. Um, but people ask, and they ask rightly, are there other higher and better uses of this? Should this be invested in our housing developments, in education, in health care? Um, so these are certainly challenges that lie ahead of us. Um, I, but I think they are also things that uh, elected officials in New York City took very seriously. So when they approved the plan to build the, uh, the, the new facilities, they also uh, designated about $400 million to go into all kinds of other services that make us safe but are not necessarily criminal justice services. So housing, health care, physical improvements uh, to uh, city, city uh, parks and other things. So um, the last thing that I just wanted to sort of raise with you um, is how is it that we can think about a kind of new model of keeping us safe um, if it doesn't rely upon uh, police incarceration uh, and all the apparatus of the criminal justice system that we've become used to relying upon? We spend a lot of time sort of under the sink with a wrench trying to make the criminal justice system fairer, um, and as well we should. We should spend a lot of time doing that. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that in the range of things that make us safe, the criminal justice system is really a very, very small part. And that we should think about what our other tools are and where we actually invest. Could we actually turn off the spigot by investing earlier um, in jobs, education, child care, physical space? In New York City, we've started the work of, th of thinking about how we actually 
um, make ourselves safe outside of the criminal justice system. Um, building safety from the neighborhood up, or as my team likes to say, putting the public back in public safety. Um, so I, this is something that's uh, called the crisis management system. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a strategy that exists in 22 neighborhoods in New York City that drives about 50% of our shootings. Uh, it's centered first on this violence interruption model. Uh, so people who have uh, been in contact with the criminal justice system who have come back to their neighborhoods uh, become violence interrupters. They know the, the people uh, who are in their neighborhoods. They know when disputes are escalating into violence. Uh, they intervene in those disputes in order to, uh, to avoid the violence. And this effort has sort of built out um, exponentially to well beyond the violence interruption model to also include year-round job training, mental health um, supports, uh, legal services, and a whole array of other kind of norm-changing efforts so, for example, every time that there's a shooting in one of these neighborhoods, uh, there's, uh, there's a shooting response. So the entire neighborhood shows up, including elected officials and a whole array of other folks, to, at the site of the shooting to essentially express, this is not normal. This is not who we are, and this is not acceptable in this neighborhood. So a shooting in Brooklyn, in Brownsville, should be as shocking to the conscience as a shooting on Fifth Avenue. Um, the result of this has been, and we've now had both an external and internal study on this, is that in neighborhoods uh, that have used this method, uh, shootings are down 30% more than in comparable neighborhoods. A second thing that we're doing um, that I actually think has enormous promise, but it's still at the very beginning, um, is uh, an effort that's uh, called Neighborhood Stat. It's a kind of CompStat, but it's focused on uh, neighborhood residents, city agencies, everything from the Parks Department to the Department of the Aging to the Police Department and our housing uh, 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 our housing authority, uh, and the notion here is that you know safety is more than just the absence of crime. Uh, safety is about all kinds of other things: physical, uh, physical environment, uh, access to work and play. Uh, and how is it that for these issues that are kind of adjacent to crime but are not crime itself, uh, how do we address and solve these pressing problems that are at the top? Um, of the list for people who live in the, uh, the neighborhoods that sort of bear the brunt um, of crime. So this is an effort that is led by uh, neighborhood re residents uh, together with about 20 uh, city agencies, nonprofits, and others uh, in a very kind of rigorous way to identify what the problems are that they see uh, and to solve them together. And similarly, this is in about 15 neighborhoods, some of which overlap with the uh, cure violence neighborhoods. Uh, in these neighborhoods, we've also seen reductions uh, across an array of crime categories uh, that outpace similar neighborhoods. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with, uh, oh, sorry. Just gonna say one last thing, physical space. Um, how physical space transforms and changes a neighborhood and changes relationships within the neighborhood has been a very, very important part of what uh, a number of our communities are doing uh, and is sort of yet another way uh, to reduce crime without the criminal justice system. So uh, I would just say that um, figuring out how we move from a system that responds to crime to one that prevents crime, from a system that sort of coerces behavior to one that encourages participation in norms, uh, something that relies on the criminal justice system alone to something that relies upon uh, residents in a broad array of public service 
Uh, I think in New York City, we're starting to see that that's kind of an emerging and new model of safety. Um, so I'll leave you with that.